this time. And so a representative question would be, um, throttles are used in your refrigerator at home. Um, so a, a refrigeration style question would be refrigerant at a pressure of something that's suitable to quickly look up the Roger and Mayhew tables on is passed through a throttle where the pressure is reduced to something else that's easy to look up the table on. Um, what's the temperature and state or quality of the fluid after the throttle? Okay, so we, we've condensed our refrigerant down to a saturated liquid. Uh, that's what the back of your fridge is all about. We'll talk about that later. And then we pass it through a throttle. And then the question is, what happens to the temperature? Um, and so forth. So that's the kind of question. I wanted to tell a story, because um, I like them. This is a use of a throttle in an industrial circumstance. It's not strictly thermodynamic, but it's interesting nonetheless. So this is a calciner, and we've got... A calciner is used for cooking uh, ceramics, pretty much, in my experience. It's used for cooking ceramics. So, you know, like, when you were in late primary school, early high school, and you had to do art, and you made pottery, and then you never took it as an elective again. Um, and with me, right, so you make something out of pottery, and then you put it in a kiln, and you fire it. Okay, so you might fire it up to a 900 degrees, 1,000 degrees, and that drives off, first of all, all the free water, and then all the chemically bonded water, and eventually vitrifies the outside. You might get a glassy surface, that sort of thing. So a calciner is doing the same thing with small powder, or this calciner, is getting small uh, hydrate particles, so they're wet, if you feel them, they're wet, and they've got chemically bonded water in them as well. So it's Al2O3, OH is hydrate, and then it's got some H2O to it. Um, and so we're driving off the water, we're driving out the chemically bonded water, we're going to take it at 900 degrees C, soak it at that temperature, and then cool it back down, um, using as little thermal energy as you can. So you try and take the energy out of the cooked product. Um, I'll show you the chart in a future lecture. But at this point, so you've got 900 degrees C product flowing through. You're using, you're putting product in, wet product, to cool the flow down. And so you've got this counter flow heat exchange thing going on. If something happens with your wet feed coming into the process, then you've got all this 900 degree product, nothing cools it down, and it goes and burns your bag house. So you've got something at the end of the process to filter out all the dust particulates. It can handle temperatures of about 200 degrees C, um, and so you're going to cook it. So you can't have that, and so you've got water injection sprays. So this is the water injection station. So normally, it uh, doesn't have any water coming out of it, but it needs to very quickly, instantaneously, um, throw water into the gas stream. The water boils and brings the temperature back down under 250 degrees C so your bags don't cook. This is what the water injection lancers look like. Um, so these are nozzles. This is facing downwards in the stream, so it sprays down and then the, the airflow is up. It captures, um, and you've got air going in there and water going in there, and so it's a air injection um, which helps the, the water atomize. And so you've got very fine particles of water that boil and evaporate very quickly in the gas stream. So they're the, they're the lancers um, out of the system. We are doing thickness tests. Right, so you take a ultimate thickness testing, ultrasonic thickness tester, um, and we're just checking to see if the particles are wearing the lancers. That's a very hard and high temperature rated steel. Um, this is the air, compressed air and water. I forget which one's which. They're different colours at a different point. Uh, so this is coming in, and we've got valves here that open and close, and they open and close varying amounts because you can't take the gas stream below 130 degrees, otherwise the sulfur that's in it will condense out as sulfuric acid and, and eat away your steel pipes. So you need to control the temperature fairly um, carefully. Uh, and so you've got variable water injection, water injection steered. Now the problem with this is that you want one megapascal of pressure of water at this point at all times so that as soon as you open the valve, water comes out. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can achieve that. Uh, one is you can have a tank of water up really high, right? But we talked earlier, 10 meters of water gives you one atmosphere. You want 10 atmospheres. 
So you have to have a tower 100 meters above this point, and I don't know if you can see the ground down there. Oh, there's a pile of um, bauxite in the background. Um, you know, we're already 40 meters up in the air, so you'd need a tower 140 meters up to create a static head of pressure. We could have a, a pressure vessel. There's some maintenance issues with some elevation. So uh, what the designers did was rather than do that, they had a pump sitting on the ground, but you can't commence to pump the water when you need it. You need the water there straight away. So these are two Grunfoss high pressure pumps, right? It's a duty and standby system. They're taking water from a tank. The water's flowing this way, inlet pressure gauge, outlet pressure gauge, and so forth. Um, so these are running, and one of these is running all the time to give you continual pressure, and the pressure is about 1.4 megapascals, 1.45 megapascals. Um, uh, Grunfoss six stage, anyway, whatever. Pumps, they're centripetal, but they're, um, they've got go through multiple stages to create the pressure. Uh, this was the design spec, right? So they take out of a tank, they go through a pump. At this stage, they thought a single stage pump could do the job. Uh, it couldn't. The outlet from the pump goes up, joins into a common pipe. This goes up to the, that says to the valve skid, right? Then they had a takeoff. They took water off, put it through a throttle, right? Which is what we're talking about. And then back into the tank. So the theory was here that when the valve at the top is closed, right, you'll build up a static head of 1.45 megapascals of pressure in this pipe, and all of that will flow through this little throttle, and we'll look at what the throttle looks like in a moment. We'll throw through this little th throttle, and the whole product of the pump will go back in the, into the tank. Right, so we ran this pump the whole time, 24-7, that's why there's duty standby, just in case the feed system ever failed, that's how important the bags were. We didn't want them to burn. Um, so that was going on. The problem was, in part because of this recirculation system, the temperature in this tank was regularly 80 degrees C. And something happens when you push fluid from 145 back down to one atmosphere. It's a tank, not a pressure vessel. So it's just at um, atmospheric pressure. Right? What happens when you put a high pressure, hot liquid through a pressure reducer that causes problems? It doesn't explode, but it's like exploding. Cool. All right. The process is called cavitation, right? And it's a process of boiling. So if you've got high pressure liquid, so this is high pressure. It goes through there, okay? It sprays through here and creates low pressure vortices in these corners, okay? And we know at low pressures, something that's 80 degrees C will boil, okay? And then that sh sheds downstream and then recondenses. And as it recondenses, it recondenses with a, a lot of pressure and it actually eats the metal away. So we were getting uh, the pipe downstream was wearing through the steel. Okay? Uh, show you some other pictures. This is a PID, Process and Instrumentation Diagram. Um, Mechies should be able to read this sort of thing, uh, but it really is the domain of um, process engineers. There's your tank, there's your pipes, there's your pumps. They come back together. That's the valve skid, and this is the orifice plate denoted FO, flow orifice. Um, physically, I couldn't find many good pictures. This is the pipe that's returning. This is, the, this is the orifice plate. And we've just replaced this section of pipe. So I had this photo in my, in my archives. This is post-job pipe. Cool, let's talk about throttles. I'll show you what the system looked like afterwards, how we stopped the boiling. But that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about restrictors to flow. So. Mass in equals mass out, and this is our governing first law steady state steady flow system. You're yawning, that's dreadful. I'm trying to, <laughs> is that, I agree, dry lectures. So, what, what assumptions can we make? These, these devices are small, okay? There's no shaft work, right? There's, there's nothing inside them, they're just a little hole. Um, there's no shaft work. 
we say they're too short to have reasonable uh, heat loss. The mass in must equal the mass out. We say the velocities and potential energy are, are negligible. Changes in that are negligible. So with a throttle, you say the entropy in is equal to the entropy out. Enthalpy in, sorry, enthalpy in is equal to enthalpy out. That seems trivial. We'll go back to our air conditioner example and we'll show that it's not. We'll do a calculation and we'll show that it's not. Um, this is Reissel's drawing of an orifice plate. Um, typically, you have to physically move them in and out, so you put a little tab like that on them. So this would be called a skillet, uh, a skillet orifice or a skillet blind if there's no hole there at all. Um, I have seen ones where this hole at the top represents the hole at the bottom. So you can look at the skillet blind and say, oh, what diameter is the orifice? Oh, 12 mil. Cool. Um, so there's some skillet blind or skillet um, orifices. Uh, you can use a partially closed valve. You've got to be careful what type of valve you choose because you can get some crazy turbulence effects um, going on. Or something that causes, otherwise causes a pressure loss but doesn't change uh, the enthalpy could be considered a throttle. So they're examples of throttles. Um, you'd say if you had a pressure difference to exploit, why don't you use a turbine? And for large flow rates, large devices, things you're willing to maintain, that's worth doing. For your fridge at home, it's not worth putting a throttle. You'd have to direct that what back into the grid. What are you doing here? Right? So you use a, you use a throttle um, rather than a turbine. So we use them in aircon and refrigeration. So small devices, um, we get a pressure <coughs> drop. I think the result of this will be surprising. So take saturated um, refrigerant, R134, uh, 134A, from a high pressure to a low pressure. So you've taken it into a high pressure, you've condensed it down to a saturated liquid, and now you're going to put it through a throttle. What's the temperature and the state of the liquid at the end of the process? So let's have a look at what that looks like. Uh, throttles. Cool. First thing we need to do is look at Rysel. I should have copied, I might do. I'll see if I can copy the appropriate table. What are we looking for? R134A. Hmm. Copy. Just so I'm not going back and forth too much. Week 442. Paste. Cooler. So now the question is, what's the state of the fluid at? 11 point, let's call it 6, bar and saturated fluid. So this is the Reissel tables. 11.6 bar, if you wondered why the pressure was so unusual, so I wouldn't have to interpolate. Right, so we've got a liquid that's 45 degrees C, all right? It's 11.6 bar, and it has an enthalpy of 263. 0.92 kilojoules per kilogram, according to the reference point that Reissel has chosen. Now we're going to drop it to a pressure of 1.06. So a pressure of 1.06. And the enthalpy won't change, right? So throttle, enthalpy in equals enthalpy out. So it's got an enthalpy of 263. We find that if it was a fluid, if it was all liquid, it would have an enthalpy of 167.25. If it was all gas, vapor phase, it would have an enthalpy of 383.37. So we find that it's come down to a saturated mixture that's somewhere between all being liquid and all being gas, right? And we know how to deal with saturated mixtures. We can find the quality. Okay, we're asked for the temperature and also the state or, qu or quality. So state would be superheated gas compressed liquid, or if it's in the saturated range, we want the quality of the fluid after the throttle. 
the first thing to note is that the temperature of the fluid after the throttle is what? Right? So the temperature of the fluid after the throttle is minus 25 degrees C. Okay? This is giving you a hint as to how air conditioners and refrigerators work. You compress the refrigerant until it's hot. You take the energy out until it's a saturated liquid. Then you run it through a throttle and the enthalpy stays the same across the throttle and the temperature comes down to something very cold. This is enough to, to cool your freezer down. Minus 25. So, what is the quality? Quality X will be uh, the enthalpy have 363.92 minus the enthalpy if it was all fluid, 25 divided by the enthalpy if it was all gas minus the enthalpy if it was all fluid. And my math says that it's got a quality of about 14 and a bit percent. So um, not much of it is vapour. It's still a lot of it is fluid. But the temperature has had a massive, um, temperature has seen a massive temperature drop. So... When you say a throttle, H in equals H out, what can that do for us? Well, it can do a fair bit. Uh, this is the end of my story. So what do we do? Oh, this is my job spec. I said replace the pipe and orifice plate. Um, this is what maintenance engineering looks like. That's what I did a lot of. What, um, we had a, a graduate engineer come in. So he just graduated uh, and been out for six months or so. Um, and what he did, which was, which was quite genius, he looked up a solution and he put in a series of orifice plates. I think there's four. Well, there's definitely four there. There might have been a fifth one upstream, so the flow is going this way in this case. And each orifice plate was larger. The hole in each of those orifice plates was larger than the hole in just the single orifice plate that we had. And so they had less pressure drop. And so over a series of things, he obviously started at 1.45 megapascals and then went down to 1.2 and then went down to 0 0.8 and so forth, all the way down to um, atmospheric pressure. And each time the, um, the lowered pressure in those low pressure areas where the vortices are wasn't enough to cause cavitation. And so the pipes um, operated reliably and it was a good story. So well done. For him, that wasn't my solution, but it was a solution to a problem in my area. That's throttles, similar devices, and a little bit of a story. Yeah, go. Do you have efficiency loss? Do you have efficiency loss through a throttle? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, so that was just like a Good. So, are you saying for an air conditioner or for this problem? Yes. No. So, do we have efficiency loss? Efficiency is a tough thing to measure because efficiency is what you want out of a system divided by what you have to put in to get it. And so you can't measure, like I saw a bubbler down in Wollongong, they've probably got them here as well. Like there's a bubbler and it says AAA water rating. I don't know what a bubbler with a AAA water rating means because the system is designed to vent water to atmosphere. So you get all of the water is lost. So what does efficiency mean? I don't know. Um, yeah, all of the energy put in to the pumps um, was lost through this process. So it's just a, a process of turning electricity into heat, um, essentially. But the, they wanted it to guarantee that have pressure available to um, spray. Deadheading the pumps was also, they were wearing out the pumps. So they should have put a triple VF motor on it and run them slightly slower, according to some calculations they did later. You would have seen energy savings yeah, there was a bunch of stuff about the system I wanted to do and applied for capital to say, really, this is the best we can do, run a pump 24-7 and just push it through an orifice. Um, but yeah, that was what you had. This, this was a job called maintaining what was there 
because this thing was, um, the cavitation was wearing that out every six months. Um, so that was a problem. Yeah, the capital was changed the system. That's that. Yeah, go, Chris. You do you end up wearing out the orifice plate? Only if you've got particulate matter in the, in the fluid stream. So if you've got relatively pure water, not very much. You don't get much of a wear, but yes, you would slowly round off and then increase the diameter of the orifice. Um, but that happens far slower than cavitation destroys things. You'll see see cavitation at the inlet of a pump impeller because it's drawing liquid in, it's spinning it out, and so you get low pressure um, points at the inside of that. So yeah, cavitation will destroy your kit. Faster than wear, much faster than wear. Yeah, go. Um, is that how they maintain pressure in um, fire systems? Is that how they maintain pressure in fire systems? I hope they've got a hydraulic accumulator. A different way of doing this, so one that doesn't involve elevation, is you get a piston and you put a mother of all masses on it, you pump water in, and then you have water out and you've got a valve. Depends on the system, but I hope they're using something like this. Um, and so it's a, it's a way of storing liquid at pressure for immediate use. Um, yeah. Mm, don't know, didn't do the math on it. Yeah, you could, you could have built something like this and then you just need enough volume to give you enough time for the pump to start. They wanted the water immediately. It's good, I love it. So you're thinking about solutions. This is, this is my version of what work looked like. Was, um, not all of you work in Illumina, but that's kind of what I did before I came here. Cool, nozzles and diffusers. Plenty of time. I don't have any examples from nozzles and diffusers. Um, not my thing. So, when you take gas through a pipe, if you haven't done um, fluid mechanics, it will be unintuitive to you, and I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader um, as to why this happens. But when you take a fluid through a pipe and you reduce the diameter of the pipe, the fluid travels faster and the pressure in the reduced section is lower than the pressure in the um, larger diameter section. Take the numbers with a grain of salt here. It, it's not a, the relationship isn't velocity times pressure equals one, which is implied here. The relationship is Bernoulli's equation. All right, we'll let you do that in uh, fluids. So nozzles and diffusers then are what we do to exploit our trade-off between pressure energy and kinetic energy, okay? Um, just a little note, everything we talk about is subsonic. At supersonic speed, so at speeds approaching the speed of sound and beyond the speed of sound, fluid in a pipe behaves very differently. And we will address that in MEC 3610 advanced thermofluids if you choose to join it. I don't think anyone who's done 2600, did they mention supersonic flow at all? If half a dozen people put their hand up. Supersonic flow, yes? Okay, there you go. So you'll, so you'll do it in uh, 2600. Good. So, an example of a question is, if you have a nozzle, it's taking gas, you're given some velocities and some pressures, and you're saying, what else can we calculate? Can we talk about inlet temperature? Can we talk about pressures? Um, the inlet temperature and exit pressure. So given some values, what do you do? Start with our equation, our first law for steady state, steady flow systems. And what assumptions can we make? Typically we say there's one inlet and one outlet. So our mass equation just becomes mass in equals mass out. Now, we can say there's no shaft work. Right? We're talking about just a cone of steel, for example, right? Um, so there's no shaft work. We can say mass in equals mass out, that's fine. Um, there may or may not be heat lost or gained throughout the nozzle. You might have a heated nozzle or an un uninsulated nozzle. Um, so we need, it to, we need to retain our Q term. We can say the change in height 
won't be significant, so we can neglect our potential energy, but we can't neglect our kinetic energy because nozzles are converting between kinetic energy and pressure, like I said, or thermal and pressure energy. So we keep our, our kinetic energy term in and we get the equation here. If we keep all the terms in, if we've got an adiabatic process, then we can say the change in our enthalpies is equal to the change in our kinetic energies on the right. Okay, so we're trading between enthalpy and kinetic energy with heat loss in or out, depending on whether it's insulated or not. So that's based on those simplifications. I'll do this calculation tomorrow because um, I want to talk about the next thermodynamic device. But you can have a go at this based on these equations, right? And you'll find you should be able to get it out. You're also going to need your ideal gas equation and your combined gas law, so your PV on T is constant. Um, and you should be able to get that out. If the question denotes negligible velocity, so it says, you know, a diffuser takes air traveling at 25 meters a second to a negligible velocity at the exit, then you consider V to be zero in that case. It doesn't work if they're both negligible, but either your inlet or your outlet, your slow velocity can be considered zero. Um, tidies the math up a little bit. So nozzles, slow at the beginning, fast at the end, high pressure at the beginning, low pressure at the end, diffusers, shaped like this, go high velocity, low velocity, low pressure, high pressure. So we're trading off between pressure and velocity. Questions about nozzles and diffusers? Excellent. Uh, you would see these in, um, I think jet aircraft would use them. So you'd have a diffuser at the, in, at the entrance to your aircraft before your compressor to slow the air down, for example. Mixing chambers. Cool. Though. So mixing chamber, when you think mixing, you might think uh, mixing two different substances. Right? We're talking about mixing a pure substance. So you're mixing water and water often steam, so for example this is steam coming in and this is then compressed liquid coming in. So you're mixing H2O and H2O but at different states and in this case you've got two inlets and one outlet. This is an example of where your steam turbine has multiple outlets. So you've got fluid coming into your turbine and then you've got one outlet going down into your open feed water heater and then you've got another outlet going down into your condenser that's then going into your first stage pump and then you've got a pump one and pump two first and second stage pumps we'll get there when we talk about the improved ranking cycle so we'll talk about open feed water heaters and some of this stuff that's going on with the turbine but for now it's worth knowing what a mixing chamber is and just the math behind how we deal with them Potentially multiple inputs, potentially multiple out outlets. Um, we can have a Q term of nothing, positive or negative, so maybe insulated, heated or cooled. Um, and we might expect them to have shaft work. So if you're stirring something, um, then you're going to be putting energy into the system. So going from the graphic from the previous page, we had steam coming in, compressed liquid water coming in, and then saturated liquid coming out. Superheated steam is mixed with compressed liquid in an open feed water heater as part of Rankine cycle. The pressure of the mixing chamber is one megapascal. There's no internal um, mechanisms for changing pressure. So this is coming in at one MPa, this is coming in at one MPa, and this is leaving at one MPa. So it's open or, or considerably open. The temperature of the incoming feed is 350 degrees and 75 degrees respectively. So 350 at 1 MPa is superheated. Um, 75 at 1 MPa is compressed liquid. What fraction of the outlet mass comes from the steam feed if the outlet is saturated water? So we've 
said here x equals zero and one MPA, so we've defined our state. Here we've said one MPA and 350, so we've defined our state, two independent uh, intrinsic variables. Here we've said one MPA and 75 degrees, so we've defined our state there. Governing equation, this is why I tell stories, because it's the same thing. The governing equation is the same thing, but it's worth recognizing the difference. So we might have different inlets and outlets, so we need to say, the sum of the mass in is the sum of the mass out. And depending on how many inlets and outlets, you have to take that completely into consideration. For the energy side of the equation, we might have heat, Q. We might have shaft work, W. We can neglect our kinetic and potential energies. And we get our sum of our mass times our enthalpy in equals sum of the mass times the enthalpy out. In the case of a simple mixing chamber, you can say, the sum of the mass oops, times the enthalpy ins equals the sum of the mass times the enthalpy outs. So it can come down to something simple. So you can see understanding the function of what the device does helps you turn something that's very big into something that's very manageable. Um, so energy is maintained, mass is, main, mass is conserved, and energy is conserved. We'll do this question, and I think it's job and knock. We'll do this question, then we'll... Um, I'll talk about anti-mixing chambers, because I think they're fascinating. Um, and then we'll call it. So, 44. Superheated steam is mixed with compressed liquid water in an insulated... So, insulated, Q is zero. No mention of a shaft providing any stirring, so work is zero. Right? And we're asked for the mass, the fraction of outlet mass that comes from the steam feed. Pretty, so that good, right? So there's steam coming in, there's water coming in, this is compressed water, and there's saturated water going out. And so the question is, if this is mass flow rate 3, this is mass flow rate 1, and this is mass flow rate 2, the question is, what's mass flow rate 1 divided by mass flow rate 3? Okay, so what fraction of the outlet mass is coming from the steam. And this is important when we talk about um, improved Rankine cycles because the question also tells you, well, what proportion of the mass is going through the rest of the cycle and being condensed in a condenser? So it, it has future relevance. I'm trying to introduce little bits that we'll put together later on. So what do we need? We need to know sum of M in H in plus sum of M E, no, must be a minus there. H E equals zero. We've got two inlets, so I've got mass one H one plus mass two H two, those should be flow rates, minus mass three H three equals zero. Okay, and we can look up H1, H2, and H3 from our tables because we've got defined states. We've got a temperature and a pressure. Here, we've got a temperature and a pressure. Here, we've got a temperature and a pressure, and they're not in the saturated state. And here, we've got a pressure and a quality. So we can find our H values for our three states. And you'll find, and you know then, you also need mass conservation, so you need mass 3 equals mass 1 plus mass 2. So your inlets must equal your outlets, otherwise you're accumulating mass or you're reducing your mass in your system. And so you've got two equations and th three unknowns, right? Unknown, 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 and equation 1 and equation 2. You find you can't find 
a solution for what mass one and mass two are, but you can find um, a fraction for mass one and mass two. All right. I'm just feeling like I'm going to open up to questions. Oh, and I'll do that in my office after the thing, so you don't need to, need to watch it. I'll talk about flash vessels, and I'll start with flash vessels tomorrow, and we'll do that maths. Just want to mention that you can do this, all right? So, and, and I will try and find a photo or a PID for flash vessels. So if you bring some feed water in, ignore this steam here, ignore what's going in there. If you bring in some feed at a high pressure and maybe like a saturated liquid into a tank that's at a lower pressure, some of the liquid will fall to the bottom, but some will flash off as steam. You'll get a proportion of it that boils and you can explore that. So within this chamber, all right, everything's got the same pressure and everything's got the same temperature. If you looked at the quality of the chamber, it would have a single quality. But if you take feed off the top, you know that it's vapor. So this has a quality of one. If you take feed off the bottom, assuming that there's both liquid and vapor, that's got a quality of zero. And so you can exploit this and we know that water particularly has very different properties at quality zero and quality one. So your vapor has much higher energy um, and you can do different things with it and your liquid has much lower energy, you can do different things with it as well. Um, what I want to show, I'll try and find it tomorrow, is we actually had um, five flash vessels in a row and each liquid offtake went to then become the feed for the next flash vessel at successively lower pressures. Um, so I'll try and find the PFD for that. Um, mixing chambers. Any questions about mixing chambers, thermodynamic devices? How you doing? Last little chat. See you tomorrow afternoon. Otherwise, you go. No, I think if I'm going to give you an equation, I'll give you the long one and rely upon you to know what simplifications are appropriate for different devices. Good. All right. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow.